Welcome into Green Dot Daily. I am Charlie DeSterco, live every weekday at 3 p.m. Eastern on the Action app and YouTube channel. We have breaking news to tend to, so we're going to start there. It's an update on John Tay Porter. He is now a former Raptors player after being banned from the NBA after internal investigations have confirmed that Porter disclosed confidential information to known sports bettors and thus limited his playing time in order for those bettors to profit. The NBA also revealing that while a member of the Raptors G League affiliate, the Raptors 905, Porter placed at least 13 bets on NBA games through a quote associates online betting account. One of those 13 bets came with Porter betting on his own team, the Raptors to lose. This is the first major athlete to be banned for life in North America since the inception of legalized online sports betting back in 2018. For more information on this, you can head over to actionnetwork.com where we continue to monitor the situation and provide updates as they come. Now let's get on to the show. Coming up, we got lots of MLB already in action, but Sean Zarrillo has a couple of bullpen spots to circle, maybe some overs to be playing throughout the matinee and night games. Michael Leboff talks to Coyotes last game at Mullet Arena. Austin Matthews looking for number 70 in the goal column. We'll have NHL picks from him there. And play-in tournament is tonight, so Jay Money hops on to talk Sixers heat and Hawks Bulls, but let's shake and bake and start out at Talladega Super Speedway. And in case you don't know, Nick Giffen of Running Hot is gonna is, is breaking down all of his NASCAR picks on the podcast through the Running Hot podcast on the Action Network platform. You can find all our videos on YouTube or through Spotify in the Action app. But we're going to bring in Nick now to talk about the NASCAR Geico 500 at Talladega Super Speedway. Nick, I'm all jacked up on Mountain Dew, ready for this race here. I need you to give me your favorite play or your first play of the day on this race. Yeah, Charlie, we're in for a good one because I've only let off Green Dot Daily for NASCAR one other time, and we swept the board. So let's try to do it again. Uh, We are going in the first pick to a group bet, and I'm going to take Eric Jones to win his group against three other drivers. That's Alex Bowman. Martin Truex Jr. and Tyler Reddick. You can get this at plus 320. And Talladega, it's a highly random track, right? It is the biggest track that NASCAR races on, the biggest oval that NASCAR races on. So they have to put these, uh, you know, limiters, essentially. uh, They're called tapered spacers and do some aerodynamic tricks to slow the cars down. And what that does, it creates a huge draft. And it's all random. It gets all shook up throughout the race. And sometimes there can be some big wrecks. And that means everybody's almost pretty equal. So if everybody is equal in a four-car group, fair odds on everybody would be three to one, right? You'd need 25%, and, and that equates to three to one. Well, Eric Jones is plus 320, and these other guys that are, are around him are about equal to him. Uh, in other races, you may maybe say they're favored, but at Talladega, I think Eric Jones should be favored in this group. If we look at these four drivers of this group in the next-gen era car, which is 2022 to present in the four Talladega races, Eric Jones has the best average running position at Talladega, the best average finish and the most laps led among this quartet of drivers. And that's also translated into finishes. Jones has three finishes of sixth place in the four Talladega next gen races. The other three drivers combined have one finish of sixth or better in 11 starts. And, That all came, those four races all came with Eric Jones and Legacy Motor Club, the team he drives for, driving Chevys, where they were getting less support from Chevy as a whole, right? Chevy supporting Hendrick Motorsports, they're supporting Richard Childress Racing, all these other teams more than they were supporting Legacy Motor Club. Well, Legacy Motor Club this year has moved over to Toyota, uh, and with only eight Toyota cars, Legacy Motor Club getting much more support from Toyota, and Toyota with the new knows that should help them in the draft. They should be uh, possibly the dominant manufacturer in this race. So Eric Jones could be even better than he's been in the past at Talladega. So I'd bet this down to at least plus 300, right? Where 25% for everyone in this group. But I do think Eric Jones should be slightly favored. So if you want to go a little shorter than three to one, I'm fine with that as well. Love this look, getting the new car while also already having the best average running position and finish, like you said, Eric Jones, he's got to remember, you know, if you ain't first, you're last. So he has to come in first here, trying to come at Geico 500 like a spider monkey. But Nick, 
the next bet you have here, it's not a, you know, best win of the group, but it's a placement finish and you're heading out to a fellow Paisan and Anthony Alfredo. Yeah, that's right. Anthony Alfredo, AKA fast pasta. So Charlie, I feel like this is a bet. You've kind of got a tail almost in like the grouper fashion, just because uh, he is your fellow Italian. But uh, this one is honestly screaming with value. 14 to one for a top 10 finish is crazy for Anthony Alfredo. Uh, look, he has two career starts at Talladega in the NASCAR Cup Series, and his average finish is 11th, and we're looking for a top 10. Uh, so that includes a finish of 10th, which is the top 10, and 12th, which is just barely outside the top 10. So, I mean, in two races, he's already well beat this plus 1,400 value. Now, it's a small sample size, of course, and that was also when Alfredo ran for Front Row Motorsports, and they were back then in 2021 – a smaller team than they are now in terms of the uh, equipment they had. They, you know, they were still two car team, but they weren't as competitive. Uh, that was when Alfredo was second to last in the full season standings among, among all full-time drivers that year. Uh, and front row motorsports as a whole only had one top 10 finish that didn't come at a super speedway or a road course, which are kind of like uh, where equipment matters less. So, um, you know, that was with Alfredo with a, a smaller team. Now he races for a part-time team in beard motorsports, which is probably why he's getting this 14 to one treatment, but it's not really a, a downgrade given how poor front row was back in 2021. If we look at beard motorsports stats at super speedways, uh, five top tens in 23 all time super speedway starts. I mean, that's already more than one in five. Uh, he has the beard motorsports, I should say, has two top tens in the 14, what I'll call the less chaotic super speedway races. So I'm removing the Daytona 500s, right? Because everybody's fighting extra hard yeah. at Daytona <laughs> and you get extra chaos. Exactly. And then there's been a few Daytona playoff cutoff races where it's winning, you get into the playoffs and those go absolutely crazy as well. So we just look at Talladega and then the Daytona races that weren't the, the super chaotic ones. Beard, or sorry, yeah, Beard Motorsports has finished in the top 10 in two of the 14, which is one in seven, which would be plus 600 as, you know, like fair odds. And that's mm -hmm. around what I have uh, at, at the Daytona 500 earlier this year. Alfredo finished 27th, not the finish we want, but he qualified 20th. He had the speed to run mid-pack and any car that qualifies and runs mid-pack at a super speedway race should be at worst, at worst. Six to one for a top 10 to finish. So I bet Anthony Alfredo down to around that six to one number and feel pretty good uh, about fast pasta and would definitely have to celebrate with some pasta if he, uh, you know, pulled off that top 10. Yeah, you know, you don't have to convince me twice to bet on an Italian. You don't have to bet on, t tell me twice to bet on a guy whose last name has to do with a great side pasta dish if you want it, Nick. I know. You know, a top 10 finish, me betting on Italians, that goes together like Chinese food and chocolate pudding. Thank you so much for hopping on. Best of luck this weekend. You're the best there is, Nick. I hope you wake up in the morning and piss excellence, my friend. We'll do our best. Uh, and uh, yeah, just enjoy Talladega. It's, it's an awesome race. You'll be on the edge of your seat the whole race. Let's ride. And we're on to Wednesday's day of the play-in tournament on the NBA side of things. In case you missed it yesterday, the Lakers fended off the Pelicans despite 40 points from Zion. They will play the Nuggets in that 2-7 seed. And then the Kings, Pelicans, square off on Friday. Though Zion Williamson is reportedly out with a hamstring injury. That's going to be interesting to watch with all the line movement there. And then tonight's games. The Bulls and the Hawks and the Sixers and the Heat on the Eastern Conference side of things square off in the play-in tournament. With that in mind, we need picks. So we're bringing in Jay Money to talk all things NBA play-in tournament on Wednesday. Jay, we'll start with Miami, Philadelphia. Joel Embiid is going to play here. He set out that last regular season game. Philly looks like a new team with him now on the floor every single time. So are you going back to the well here with the Sixers right around five, five and a half point favorites? You have to rock with the Sixers here, man. This team comes into the playing tournament absolutely red hot. Uh, I'm not going against them right now. They have they closed the regular season winning eight straight games, and they actually covered 10 straight games as well. They've won five straight since uh, Joel Embiid was back in the lineup as well. So even before him, they had started to get back into the uh, into the rhythm of things. I really like the trades that they made at the uh, deadline as well, getting guys like Buddy Hill, uh, even Campaign has gave them some things off the bench as well. So this is a really deep squad. Can't forget about Tobias Harris, uh, 
Kelly Oubre Jr. as well. So uh, and Terry Rozier is out starting point guard for the Heat mm -hmm. as well. But even if he was in there, I'd still like the Sixers in this one. This team is just red hot, and they really have an opportunity to go deep into the Eastern Conference playoffs as well. So uh, I have a lot of confidence with the Sixers win this game. I'll lay the five points with them as well. Um, they're really rolling right now. Yeah, we've seen money pour in on Philadelphia. They've gone from, you know, four point favorites all the way up to this five, five and a half mark. You know, it, it just feels like the perfect time for this to buy the Sixers. They're all finally getting healthy. They have the entire lineup back. Heat, you mentioned no Terry Rozier. So that could loom large, just not having your point guard that you acquired over the, the season. But I also uh, agree with you on the Sixers for what it's worth, which I don't know if that's the kiss of death or not. But the other game is Atlanta and Chicago. Trey Young is back. He's playing in this one. The Bulls are right now three point favorites. How are you betting this one? Yeah, and I could be wrong, but like me personally, I'd like the Hawks better without Trey Young. That's just, I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm just on an island with that. But we saw this team go on a crazy streak. Dejounte Murray was going for triple doubles almost every single game. They just seemed like the vibes were a whole lot better without Trey Young out there. But not even that, they're missing Jalen Johnson as well. He's one of those players um, that like he doesn't really show up with the point spread, but he means a lot to the Atlanta Hawks. They won't have him. They won't have Sadiq Bay. They won't have a Kongu as well. So three really interchangeable players that mean a lot to the Hawks defensively as well. But the Hawks coming to the this game in absolutely horrible form in my opinion man it's the exact opposite of the philadelphia 76ers they've lost six straight games they're 0 and four in their last four on the road one and six straight up as well in their last seven games on the road so this team is not really playing connected as well i think the vibes are bad overall in atlanta and i wouldn't be a bit surprised if this was trey young's last game in atlanta man a little hot take there so i will rock with the bulls in this one hopefully the rose and um and his daughter can uh, get to scream in here once again and uh and have the hawks shooting bad free throw here but regardless i think just trey young coming back really messed up the vibes of this team if he was out i would actually probably like the hawks here but with him in here um i don't like their uh, the the him and Dejounte murray meshing i think that this will be trey young's last game with an atlanta hawks uniform so give me the bulls minus three here bold words about potentially trey young's last game in atlanta it does feel like the vibes are off and you know you mentioned all the injuries piling up on atlanta just the lack of depth might loom large, especially against the Bulls, who will be home tonight as short favorites. But, of course, we can't let you go without talking the Lakers' Nuggets. It's going to be a highly anticipated series. Obviously, the Nuggets did not end up getting that one seed. So the Lakers winning last night puts them in another matchup here, like a Western Conference Finals rematch. What are your initial thoughts on this series? Do the Lakers stand any chance, or are you buying the Nuggets? I mean, I'd like to say that, hey, the Lakers have revenge. Like, I'm a revenge type of a narrative type of guy, but it's just a different it's a different type of league these days, man. And once I, one thing I've noticed, once sometimes a team just owns you. I mean, and that's what we've seen. Now, when you have the Nuggets that swept the Lakers last year in the Western Conference Finals, and then they every single matchup they faced off this year, you lost all of those as well. So that's why I say if the revenge was going to matter, you would have uh, you would have won on the night that Kobe's statue would have been unveiled or something like that. And just every single time they play them even if they have a lead at the half they just can't deal with the nuggets and like for a full 48 minutes um, the nuggets will just come back and, and uh, impose their will on them in the fourth uh in the fourth quarter here so i'm not gonna lie i don't really have a ton of confidence in the lakers to be even keeping this uh series close um i thought they had a chance last year and the nuggets just did whatever they wanted to so um to be perfectly honest with you i do think that the um that the nuggets should probably get this job done maybe like 4-1 4-2 in this series in this one the lakers have lost eight straight matchups versus the Denver Nuggets they just really seem like they own them uh, in my opinion so I wouldn't be a bit surprised if the Nuggets won this series actually pretty easily here to be honest with you yeah eight straight oh, I didn't even know that that is uh you know that is not good unless unless LeBron turns back the clocks back to the early 2000s I don't know uh if the Lakers are gonna be able to pull this one out especially with AD also you know he did play yesterday didn't look the best and is dealing with back spasms himself but Jay Money, thank you so much. Enjoy the NBA play-in tonight, and we'll be talking to you very soon. Yes, sir. Anytime. Let's cash. Over to the NHL, and the Eastern Conference playoffs are finally set. We talked long about that wild card race that heated up, but the Washington Capitals securing that last spot. They get the New York Rangers, who lifted the President's Trophy, and they are minus 450 favorites. No surprise there as heavy favorites. And then the number two seeded Carolina Hurricanes against the Fighting Leboffs. Carolina minus 340 against the Islanders at plus 280. The Bruins and Maple Leafs will square off. And then the Florida Panthers and Tampa Bay Lightning round us out with that minus 170, 145 price. 
Keeping that in mind, we welcome in Michael Leboff to talk some NHL. Michael, we have to talk about the Islanders and the Carolina Hurricanes because, you know, you like pain, you like the Islanders. So tell me why you're going to be putting money down on them to win this series. Yeah, yeah, those two things uh, go hand in hand, uh, especially this season. It's been a and it's been a roller coaster for the Islanders. Meanwhile, the the Hurricanes have been one of the uh, more stable teams uh, throughout the entire second half. I mean, since Christmas, the Christmas break, the Hurricanes have arguably arguably been the best team in the NHL. Uh, so I I understand why this this line looks this way uh, going into a series. These two teams faced off last year, and the odds were a little bit tighter. Um, and I think you can make an argument that the Islanders were worse, but I also think that the Hurricanes were were dealing with some injuries and worse back then too. Um, but I actually do think there's a, a smidge of value here on the Islanders. Uh, they are going into the playoffs in great form. They've won eight of their last 10, eight, one and one in that span. They're playing uh, a meaningless game against the Penguins. So I don't think that one will really change too many, uh, too, too many opinions either way, unless there's, you know, of course, an injury, unfortunately. Uh, but I think with the way the Islanders are rolling and the edges that they do have, they have a chance to make this into a, a tighter series than these odds imply. That starts with the goaltending. Uh, Simeon Varlamov has been red hot down the stretch. They also have a very, very capable deputy in, in Ilya Sorokin, who came into the season as the Vezina Trophy favorite. So it just goes to show you just how good that Islanders goaltending tandem is. Defensively, they've been rock solid since uh, Patrick Watt took over. When he did, the Islanders were one of the worst teams in the league, one of the leakiest defensive teams in the league. Uh, they were one of the worst teams in the league, I should say, at, at preventing big scoring chances. Now they're typically one of the best. So I think that this team, they, they just have a little bit more teeth to them uh, than than the odds imply. They're getting much better production from the middle of their lineup. Guys like Pierre Angval and Anders Lee have started to round into form. So, uh, yeah, I think the Islanders are are live here. I, I wouldn't be rushing to bet the Hurricanes at this kind of price. Expect the unexpected in the NHL playoffs. I know Andy McNeil came on yesterday, said that his uh, Stanley Cup pick is the Hurricanes. So it'll be interesting to see if Andy versus Leboff go head to head here. But it, I, you, you do make a good point. I think the Islanders, you know, may be a little bit undervalued here given the goaltending edge and given the you know a tumultuous season that has trended toward the right direction at the right time in the playoffs but you know let's switch gears to the Bruins and the Maple Leafs now and this one is I think the biggest coin flip at least that's what the prices indicate when it comes to a series price Boston gets home ice but the Maple Leafs you know they're they're slight underdogs here do you think that they have the chance to pull off the upset or are you siding with the Bruins here at the short favorite yeah, I think this price is fine on the Bruins, actually. Uh, I think w when you look at these two teams, it's very much a styles make fights, a strength versus strength matchup where the, the Maple Leafs have the, that star power up front. They've got the league's most prolific goal scorer in Austin Matthews. Uh, and then Boston will counter with an elite defense core and, and perhaps the league's best goaltending tandem for the, the past two seasons. And then you look at the weaknesses for Toronto. It's a, a blue line that doesn't look like one that you'd expect can shoulder the load of a Stanley Cup playoff run. Uh, and then the goaltending, too, has a lot of question marks. Ilya Samsonov has been up and down all year, looked like he had righted the ship, and then just at the worst possible time has, has lost his form. Joseph Wool got hurt after a really good start to the season and, and hasn't found his form since returning from injury. So there's some question marks there. The Leafs are a little banged up. Uh, and I think that people are underestimating Boston's depth a little bit here. I think that players like Morgan Geeky uh, and, and Trent Frederick may not register with uh, a lot of you know betters or casual fans but they're pretty important in this in this role uh in this series i should say uh playing their roles so i think that there's enough here to, to lay a little bit of juice with boston i wouldn't really go much further than minus 130 but with home ice and the advantages that they have i think uh the bruins are are the right side here very rare to see leave off on a favorite uh you know it, it, it's something weird to hear you side with uh with, with the bruins here but Let's talk tonight's game in general. Um, you know, there still is a day of regular season hockey left. Um, more, more meaningless than not, but Toronto does play Tampa to playoff teams. Uh, you don't have a pick on the side or a total here, but there is a guy that you think is undervalued when it comes to the scoring department. Yeah, I'll tip my cap to, to Tim Kalinowski, who co-hosts uh, Line Change with me and Nick Martin about this call. He, he likes Nick Robertson uh, to get on the board as an anytime goal scorer. I think that's a a pretty savvy bet. Uh, the The Leafs will be really careful with the minutes for their players in this in this game because it's completely meaningless for both sides. Don't want to see anyone get hurt. And like I said, they're already banged up. So I think players like Mitch Marner and William Nylander, 
Uh, those guys are uh, Austin Matthews, even though he's chasing 70 goals. If he does play tonight, like their their minutes are going to get managed. That means we're going to see some some good opportunities for players like Nick Robertson, who can can really shoot the puck. Uh, he's on a, a little bit of a heater right now. Should be around four to one. Uh, so if you can find, you know, make sure to look around right now. I see like plus three sixties out there. I th- I still think that that's fine. Um, if you're looking for a little bit of a sweat on this on this game. I want to talk a little bit more about Austin Matthews uh, here. Um, You know, obviously you mentioned that he is one goal off 70. He's minus 135 to score tonight. He had an eight game goal streak prior to Tuesday night. Is this, uh, you know, a a spot where maybe you bet on Matthews to score the first goal because you don't know how much he'll play to get that 70. Is it worth an opportunity or is it worth a bet in general on him to get to that 70 mark? Yeah, I think you're probably right. I would go with with the last goal, right? Like, because if you think uh, the the Leafs are down and they pull their goalie, he'll be out there on the six and five. Uh, conversely, if they're up and the, the Lightning pull their goalie, uh, he'll definitely be out there looking for the empty netter to cap off a seventy game, uh, seventy goal season. So I think I think so. And I mean, look at, at minus one thirty five. It's not like you're being asked to lay a huge number. So I think if you're a Leafs fan or want to see it, uh, that's that's totally fine, especially with the way he's scoring. I mean, those odds make sense when you consider he's scoring like sixty nine out of however many games he's played this season. I think he's around seventy eight or so. Yeah, he's definitely, you know, I assume the motivation is going to be there. Just don't know how many minutes he'll be on the ice, just given how much this game does not matter. But it is a great mark to hit 70 goals in general. But the other game tonight, Pittsburgh Islanders, uh, another game that you are looking at goal scorers. You have two in particular, though, that you like. Yeah, a couple more. Uh, I like Oliver Wallstrom uh, in this spot with the Islanders. He's not played in quite a bit here, but he is an offensive threat. He's got a great shot. Uh, he will play on the first line tonight with Matt Barzell being rested because the team, uh, this game is meaningless for them. So you should catch some some pretty big numbers here on Wallstrom. Uh, he's he's going to get power play time. He's going to play alongside Bo Horvat. He should be up there in terms of time on ice leaders as as the Islanders want to at least keep him fresh and, and and conditioned for in case they need to tap his shoulder uh, in the playoffs. So if you're getting uh, closer to four to one on, on Wallstrom, I think he's definitely worth it. Um, like I said, he got a great, a great shot and, and should be a threat on a power play. And what is a game that who knows how this one's going to play out with neither team having anything to play for uh, in the other game uh, as well. I like Mitchell Chaffee. I don't think I got to mention him in that Leafs oh. game. Uh, he's he's a pretty big price for the Lightning. Like I said, with Robertson, I just think the Lightning are going to be so careful with with their big guns minutes. Right. Like Kucherov, he's one assist away from. 100. So if he gets that, I wouldn't be surprised if they just sent him to the locker room. They'll be careful with Stamkos and Point and all those guys. So I think that someone like Mitchell Chaffee could end up playing, you know, setting a career high in terms of minutes and and usage. He could end up on like a power play. Uh, so right. uh, I do think that he he makes some sense here at a big number. A lot of long prices trying to take advantage of where, you know, rest can come into play. I think that that's the best way to attack this. And another, you know, Meaningless game for the Edmonton Oilers, but maybe everything for the uh, Coyotes. Uh, the final game at Mullet Arena, or what seems like it is, you know, the players were reportedly told that the Coyotes are going to move to Salt Lake City next season. I was looking on, uh, you know, on StubHub, and the tickets were three hundred and ninety-five dollars for the cheapest seat at Mullet Arena for tonight's game. Uh, max capacity five thousand people. They call it a party barn for a reason. Uh, is there any talking me off of the Arizona Coyotes money line or should, are you joining with me? No, absolutely. This is one of those bets that if you, if you're someone who's just grinded through an entire NHL season betting, uh, you know, every night or close to it, uh, this is such a nice way to kind of cap it off. It's, it, and and I mean that with all due respect to Coyotes fans. Um, <laughs> I, I totally, I feel for them as an Islander fan, like the Islanders almost moved for, Hundreds of times it felt like during my formative years, but so I do I do sympathize with them. But um, as a as a hockey better who's who's fallen kind of fallen in love with this Coyotes team with the prices that we've been dealt with on them, especially at Mullet Arena, um, this is a pretty pretty poetic way to go out. And I think that you know you're you can bet this however you want. Like I, you want to bet like alternate puck lines on the Coyotes. I I don't think that you're gonna get even close to the Oilers' best effort here. So Coyotes to win in a shutout, however crazy you want to get with it. It's fine because it's look, it's the last two nights of the regular season. This is going to be one of the final regular season bets you make. Why not have a little fun with it? Go chase a big price. And you'll always remember uh, the night that the uh, the Coyotes left Arizona for the first time. Yeah. They, they might go back. 
this this is, I think, the the peak Michael Leboff game. Like you could get seven different ways to bet the Arizona Coyotes in their final game. Edmonton could be wrestling players. They don't have anything to play for in this one. But Michael Leboff, thank you so much. Best of luck on you know your goal scorer props tonight, and and you know hopefully you can avoid some pain this weekend with uh, the Carolina Islander series. I appreciate that. Thanks, Charlie. And we're nearly a month through the MLB season. So let's take a look at how the American League standings have shaked out. You look at the Cleveland Guardians, the best team in baseball on the American League side, leading with a 12 and 5 record. The New York Yankees with Juan Soto look like a team that is revived despite Aaron Judge's slump. Even down the us further the kansas city royals detroit tigers in that wild card spot right now the american league east in general looking strong as always with the rays and blue jays both above 500 as well but two teams that are missing which you know is there some cause for concern the houston astros and the minnesota twins the twins and astros both making the playoffs last year of course and right now off to a very slow start and with that, we welcome in MLB expert Sean Zarillo to break down the American League picture. Sean, I know you just put in a couple of bets into the app regarding Toronto and Kansas City, but I want to start with Houston. And this is a team that I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit concerned of in general just because of the amount of pitching injuries that are, you know, piling up. Obviously, Justin Verlander returns this weekend, but Framber Valdez hurt, Luis Garcia, Lance McCullers, Jose Urquidy, they have a laundry list of pitcher injuries. Are you pressing the panic button yet on this team? No, not at all. And every projection system out there from Bakota, Fangraphs, ATC, still has this game winning the American League West and still has them making the playoffs over 60% of the time. So not at all worried about Houston from a making the playoffs perspective. But in terms of their upside and winning the World Series in a wide-open American League, yeah, I think their time has finally come where the clock might have ticked midnight. It's been a slow progression away from analytics and towards scouting and towards the owner and Jeff Bagwell brought in his advisor to make decisions and getting rid of James Click, James Lunau, or Jeff Lunau getting you know suspended by Major League Baseball. But the fingerprints that were all over what made this team and what made this roster are no longer there. And they have a huge hole at first base with Jose Abreu and John Singleton trying to figure it out and neither of them hitting. And obviously, as you mentioned, all of the pitching injuries, I do expect those guys to come back at some point. And I think this team eventually gets over 85 wins and at worst finishes in a wild card spot. I might prefer the Rangers the rest of the way, but even Seattle seems like they should have a very high floor given all the starting pitching. So not too worried about Houston, definitely more worried about the Twins considering Carlos Correa is injured. And he has some long-term injury concerns in addition to the short-term concerns he's currently addressing. Royce Lewis seems to get hurt every time he steps on a field. But when he's on the field, he seems like one of the best players on the field. But the Twins are hitting 143 with the runners in scoring position currently, which is last in baseball. So they should expect some positive offensive regression moving forward. But I do think the Central Division is better than we expected it to be coming into the season and better than it has been in recent seasons. And I think any of the Tigers, the Royals, or the Guardians could absolutely take it down. So... I think the Twins are a very vulnerable favorite at this point, and certainly, as you mentioned, interested in other teams besides them to make and maybe make the playoffs out of the Central. Right. The Astros, you know, it's it's interesting just hearing you talk about it, looking at these projections. You know, Pakota has Houston right around 90 wins still, despite this slow start. All the injuries pitch, uh, on the pitching side are, like you know, piling up. It almost feels like this is a team that is like the Phillies of last year where maybe they might be, you know, a few games under 500 in a month or two, you can maybe get them at a, at a better price to make a deep run in the playoffs when all these guys get back, because obviously we know what they're capable of when they're at full health. The Minnesota twins though, a bit of a concern, you know, Pablo Lopez, not himself to start the season, Byron Buxton flirting around that Mendoza line when it comes to average. So let's talk that AL central division. Uh, there is a team in particular that you are high on that you think, you know, the early season success is something that's sustainable. Yeah, Kansas City's been mashing since the second half of last year. This offense is legitimate. My main concern with them is depth and the fact that they have no prospects really who are due to come up this year and contribute to this roster. Uh, and they really have no prospects either that they can trade and acquire other pieces for. But I think the biggest weakness on this team is their bullpen. Their rotation seems pretty deep. They have Cole Reagans at the top. who looks like an AL Cy Young candidate. Bobby Witt is hitting like an AL MVP candidate. But then even Lugo 
and Brady Singer and Waka, like these guys are going to give them solid innings every time out. And considering their offense should score about five runs per game, I think the Royals have a chance to keep winning games in a weaker division and potentially pull it out. Shane Bieber getting hurt for the Guardians certainly limits their ceiling. The Tigers can't seem to score more than four runs a game themselves. They're going to continue pitching well. And I just think the overall package of the Royals, obviously the pitching isn't as good as Detroit, but the lineup is significantly better. And I think you sort of have this offensive-driven team and this pitching-driven team who are vying to take the next step up within this division. But the Guardians always play 500 baseball regardless. So if this entire division ends up sinking back to where we expected you know, in the preseason, I certainly think uh, the Guardians could win this division by winning 84 or 85 games. But I think the Tigers with the Royals have a higher upside to maybe push forward and get into that next year. Now, because of the Central being a little bit stronger, it may squeeze out a team from the AL East or the AL West. You know, coming into the year, it seemed like right. the Yankees and the Orioles and the Rays and the Rangers and the Astros and the Mariners were fighting for five spots, right? They're two division winners and then three wild card spots, which leaves two of those teams getting squeezed out. But if two of the teams from the Central make it, and now you have fewer in division games, these teams are going outside of the division more frequently to play games. It's more of a chance to knock out these teams directly. And if two teams from the Central make it, it means that one of the other teams from the AL East or the AL West just ends up getting squeezed out of the playoff picture. So the team that I like least amongst all the teams I mentioned is the Toronto Blue Jays. And even though projections, Dakota has them right now at 70% to make the playoffs, Fangraphs, ATC have them closer to 50%. Where I would put their projected win total for the end of the year, I probably like them less. And towards Seattle, towards the lower end of all of those other teams. So, yeah, I see major holes in the lineup for Toronto. They really do not seem deep offensively. They're built on defense, but that doesn't really matter if all of your pitchers, like Kevin Gaussman, are getting hurt and uh, Alec Manoa not going to give them anything going forward. And even their two best relievers came back yesterday, Jordan Romano, Eric Swanson. Those guys are both dealing with arm injuries, and there's no reason why either of those guys can't go back on the aisle at some point. So, yeah, I like Toronto to miss the playoffs and plus money. I like Kansas City to make the playoffs a 265 or better. And we'll see how this AL playoff picture ends up shaking out. But these central divisions do seem like they're a touch stronger in both leagues than they have been in recent years. Yeah. And, you know, the Kevin Gosman thing, I think, is most interesting because I think even looking at the Blue Jays pitching, you know, they don't have a fifth starter right now. And yeah. Jose Barrios, I don't know if he's tr if he's as trustworthy as you can make it. And then you look at, you know, Kevin Gosman, he – had a delayed start to spring because of shoulder fatigue. Now he's pitching and he's getting battered. And it's like, is there something underlying? We've already seen this, you know, epidemic that's coming around pitchers right now with injuries. It's super interesting to at least keep an eye on how, how Guzman pitches. And he's pitching tonight against, you know, the Yankees as well. The Yankees also one of those teams that has pitched and played above, or I guess, you know, to expectation. Finally, they always expected to have been one of the competitors in the East. And now they're actually playing like the best team in baseball, but I do want to talk real quick about the NL because, uh, you know, I'm a Mets fan. You know, you're from New York. We're, we talk about the Mets a lot. This turnaround that this team has had, they've gone 0 and 5 to start the season with complete bullpen collapses. And I was like, all right, 0 and 162 is inevitable. And now they're 9 and 8 and they're looking like a different team. I said, I know we, we did the NL East podcast together on Payoff Pitch. And I said that I think with no expectations, this is a team that you could maybe make a case for to make the playoffs at a near two to one price. Do you kind of feel something similar with this team or do you still think that, you know, expectations should be tempered just given how well they've been playing right now, but how bad they were in the beginning? Yeah. The team I like to secure the final wild card spot in the NL coming into the season is the San Francisco giants. And they've started out a little bit slowly. And I would say the projections still think there's value on the giants to make the playoffs at this point, but the Mets are starting to come into range for me. Obviously, the Braves losing Spencer Strider. Like, I still think the Braves are going to win the NL East. Maybe it gives right. the Phillies a little bit more of a chance to win the division. And I don't think the Mets are in range to actually win the division ultimately. And they have played a lot of bad teams. You know, you have to bake in a soft schedule for the Mets to start as well. But they looked pretty good in Atlanta, and they're coming back on teams late. And I think that's the biggest key. I'm always looking for teams who don't give up when they're down late. The Orioles have been doing it constantly to teams this year. The Guardians have done it a number of times. The Dodgers do it every season. The Astros typically do it every season. They haven't done it yet this year, and that's a bit of a red flag for me. But the Mets are absolutely coming back on teams late. I think David Stern's fingerprints are already all over this team, and it's already extending into the minor leagues as well. He's introduced a pitching lab. Christian Scott looks tremendous in AAA. They have Kodai Sengo likely coming back at some point. J.D. Martinez is going to join this lineup at some point. And they have other prospects. Luis Angel Acuna, Drew Gilbert, 
were outfielders in AAA that they acquired for Scherzer and Verlander at the deadline last year. So if they have any injuries, they have top prospects who are ready to come up and ready to roll into this lineup. Brett Beatty looks significantly improved. We'll see how right. that hamstring injury ends up doing. But yeah, I think the Mets are significantly improved relative to last year. They still rate really poorly in defensive ratings, which is surprising because I actually project them as a well above average defensive team. And we may end up seeing that improvement at some point. So the improvements in terms of pitching and defense that you always saw on those Milwaukee teams run by David Stearns, I think they're eventually going to leak over into the DNA of this Mets team. And as you mentioned, lower expectations just seems to be getting the fans a little bit extra juice watching this team play and certainly having Max the rally pimp there for all of these games. I hope they keep paying for his tickets because he seems to be giving good luck to this team at the moment. Yeah, they're currently nine and eight. Uh, you know, after starting out zero and five, they have new life. And you mentioned, you know, th- that wild card spot in the NL is is so jam packed. You know, other than the Dodgers in Atlanta, I feel like every team is within three wins on projected from top to bottom there. But let's move over to tonight's or today's slate. Obviously, we have so many games that are in progress as we speak right now. But there is a game that's you know underway in about ten minutes, and that's you know the Arizona Diamondbacks and the Chicago Cubs. Uh, D-backs are slight favorites with Brandon fought on the mound against Jordan Wicks. It's not John Wick, it's Jordan. So you're fading Mr. Wicks here and going with the D-backs. Yeah, and a big fade of the Cubs bullpen as well. The bullpens are exhausted in this series. They're exhausted in the Range Angels series that we'll talk about. And they're also exhausted in the Red Sox Guardian series. And those six teams all have to play on Thursday in addition to playing today. Two, 20 of the 30 teams are off tomorrow. But all six of these teams have exhausted bullpens today have to play tomorrow. And in particular for Jordan Wicks, he throws a lot of pitches. He hasn't made it through a fifth inning yet this year, strikes out a lot of guys, walks a lot of guys. That's a real problem against this Diamondbacks lineup. The Diamondbacks have the lowest strikeout rate in baseball this season, had one of the lowest strikeout rates in baseball last season. They also have the fourth highest walk rate. So this team fouls off a lot of pitches. They take a lot of pitches. They're very patient. I think they're going to knock out Wicks before the fifth inning here too. The problem is the Cubs don't really have a bridge or any relievers to get them to the late innings. Uh, Luke Little and Drew Smiley have thrown on consecutive days. Albert Ozilai blew the save last night. Yancy Almonte, Leiter, and Hector Neris, in addition to Ozilai, have all pitched three times in the past four days. So who gets the innings in the middle innings behind Jordan Wicks today? Meanwhile, Brandon fought his stuff plus numbers a little bit down from last year, but his command has improved, and he's ranked as an above-average pitcher per pitching plus for the past two seasons. I think his regular season numbers kind of indicated the postseason success that he ended up having, and he's gotten hit hard a little bit this year, but I do think he's going to be a top flight pitcher moving forward. And honestly, I think he's going to be better than Zach Gallon when it's all said and done. So I like this Arizona team better. They do have a little bit of tire relievers in their bullpen too. Kevin Ginkle worked back-to-back days. They have a couple other guys who work back-to-back days. But other than that, they do have a deeper bridge and they have a deeper bullpen in terms of Wednesday night's matchup. But as I said, it's kind of odd for these managers to manage these bullpens today, knowing they have another game tomorrow and everybody's already exhausted. But Arizona, I made minus 140 for the first five innings, made the minus 130 for the full game. So there's room there on either price up to about minus 130 and minus 120, respectively. Um, And then the total, I made 9.6 runs. The one thing to keep an eye on, the roof has been open in Arizona the past two nights. It's going to be closed today. So not going to get as many runs as you might expect with that roof open and more air leaking into Chase Field, but definitely still see an over here and would probably consider a live over as well. Once this game's in progress, if you can get a live over six and a half or seven, if there's no early scoring with these starters, I do think once you get to the middle innings, especially as that pitch count racks up for Wicks, the runs are going to start coming. Yeah. And and in general, we've seen, you know, bullpens really struggle at the start of the season, you know, that has led to a bunch of bullpen collapses for good or for bad. And so the other game tonight, there's no, there, there's like three games on the night schedule, which is just absurd to think about. But there is one in particular that you're targeting, and that's the Angels against the Tampa Bay Rays. Reed Detmer is a 40% strikeout rate through his first three starts and has looked absolutely incredible. But you are fading him and some possible negative regression on the horizon for him. Yeah, this is another big bullpen differential here. So the Rays have had Jason Adam uh, and Phil Matone work back to back days. But other than that, their bullpen is basically. Fully ready to go. Garrett Clevenger threw 26 pitches yesterday. He should be available to pitch tonight. But the Angels blew the save yesterday. Carlos Estevez, their closer, has worked back-to-back days. Uh, Matt Moore, Luis Garcia have also worked back-to-back days. And then Luis Cisnero and Adam Simber have also pitched three times in the past five days. And their long reliever won 27 pitches yesterday. So the Angels, again, don't really have a bridge to get between Detmers 
and their bullpen, and they don't really have their closer or any of their top flight relievers available either. So the Rays should have a big, big bullpen advantage in the late innings. I certainly project Detmers as a better starter than Zach Little. But once this game comes to the late innings, I like the Rays live. I like them pregame up to about minus 130. And then I also like the over in this matchup. You could bet that up to about 8.5 minus 107. But also another game where I'd be looking for a live over six and a half, live over seven in progress. If these starters are pitching well early, if the pitch counts are getting up, they're just a little bit for Detmers. They have no bullpen to go to once he's done with his day. So like the live over, but also like the over pregame. And as you mentioned, there's only three games on this night slate. The third is Guardians and Red Sox. And I like the over there too. Very similar situation to what I just talked about with the bullpens in these other games. And just <laughs> as a reminder, they also have to play tomorrow. Bullpen, attacking the bullpen seems like a very good strategy early on, especially with all these overs. Feels weird to say that we're betting a lot of overs in baseball yeah. just in general. But Sean Zarello, best of luck on the rest of the slate. Enjoy the day, baseball, and we'll talk soon. Let's hope for some runs tonight. Thank you for having me. And just a reminder that any pick we give out here on the show, you can easily reference by following Green Dot Daily at that handle at Green Dot Daily in the Action Network app. We keep track so you don't have to. And that's going to be all from Green Dot Daily. Thanks for sticking with us today on this fine Wednesday. Just a programming note. Franchise mode with Johnny Manziel and Kurt Banker breaking down Drake May when it comes to his NFL intangibles, best fit, and more is coming up shortly on the Action Network YouTube channel. So go check that out. There's also the previous episodes as well from the series. But I'm Charlie DeCirco. We'll be back here tomorrow with Brendan Glasheen hosting at 3 p.m. Eastern in the Action Network app and the Action Network YouTube channel. You all have a great day.